Welcome to Bowtie, sometimes cool, with myself, Ashley, and Ed. Evening, Ed. Good evening, Ash. How are you? Very good, thank you. And this evening we're joined by Christopher Naylor, actor and artist who plays Harry Sullivan for The Big Finish. As with the previous weeks, when we have a Doctor Who guest, Ed is the main man here, and I know that he's got plenty of questions there. Looking like he's got a big stack of paper there, Ed. Are you all ready? I'm ready if you're ready, gentlemen. Ready. ready. With that in mind, then, I will hand over to you, Ed. Okay, Chris, um, thanks very much for coming on and uh, giving us some of your value of the time. I've got a few questions here, really, about you, about what you do, about your acting, about your art. Um, so we're going to start with, really, right back from the beginning. When did you realise you wanted to be an actor? Well, I mean, it's, it's kind of lost in the mists of time, but uh, I can remember going to see Star Wars when I was five, which was a clue to my age. Um, and uh, and being completely sort of captivated by it um, and uh, coming home and setting out my chairs in my bedroom uh, in a sort of X-Wing fighter formation uh, <laughs> and uh, pretending to be Luke Skywalker. Um, so that was very uh, that was very influential. And of course, Doctor Who was uh, was big in my life at the same time. So I was uh, at school uh, in the playtime. I would play it being the doctor and I had my long scarf and all that and uh, I would climb in and out of the wardrobe uh, the usual kind of stuff um, and at some point I think I shifted from wanting to be a uh, time lord or uh, you know or James Bond or you know all of these characters uh, to realizing that there was this great job where I could actually play those people I could turn up somebody would get a camera out uh, or whatever and um, uh, I could you know, be those people uh, and be on a screen or something. And uh, so as soon as I realised that acting was a job, then I guess, you know, I was away. So, you know, pretty early, really. So really it was something from a very, very early age you had an interest in. Yeah, yeah. And I think uh, I got the uh, the Making of Doctor Who book <laughs> um, and I would always read interviews with Roger Moore whenever they're in the paper uh, and watch the, the premieres of all the Bond films on telly. Uh, you know, when they when they live from Leicester Square and all that. Um, and it just seemed like the most exciting thing in the world that I could possibly do. As well as being an actor, you're an artist as well. Yeah. So a bit of a question here, a bit of an Ed sort of question. Do you see yourself as an actor who paints or a painter who acts? Um, I'd say an actor who paints. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think there was a point when I was probably a teenager um, when I was drawing a lot. Um, more than I was doing any sort of amateur dramatics. I, I, you know, I did drama at school. But uh, how I expressed myself as a child and a young person was to draw everything. So uh, I think I had a, a bit of a dilemma as to whether I'd be an illustrator or an actor. Illustrator I mean, it seemed like a great job to me. Um, and I think I loved reading books and I loved Asterix books, particularly when I was young uh, and... Um, uh, so there was a bit of a, a, a sort of dilemma, I suppose, for a, a, a short period. But then I started doing more acting and it kind of took over. So, yeah, I mean, I would say I'm an actor who who paints, but there are occasions when they sort of vie for supremacy and maybe the, uh, the art slightly. It's like a horse race, really. And one of them gets its nose ahead of the other just slightly. <laughs> so it does. It varies. But no, I'm really an actor who paints. And I've been reading your bio as well of things you've done. And mm. um, it says you had a pass in the crown, which is yeah. huge. So how did that actually come about? Well, I have possibly the smallest part in the hugest series. So uh, um, it's uh, if, if you can spot me, I probably deserve some sort of medal or a bonus or something. But interestingly, um, I got that part uh, just through an audition, but I was recording uh, with Big Finish. Um, that day, and uh, I was working with Peter Davison. Who was I playing? I was, I think I was playing was I a robot of some description. Can't, I was playing Chameleon, I think, was I? I can't remember now, because um, I did a few things with Peter. Um, and uh, in my lunch hour, uh, I had a message from my agent saying that they were casting for a part of a, a valet, a valet, you should say, a butler, in other words. Um, for um, uh, Princess Margaret's husband, so Helena Bond Carter's, Carter's husband, um, and uh, they needed a self-tape 
that afternoon, this was a Friday, um, and they were going to be filming on the Monday. And I said, well, I'm in the studio. I can't do it. I, I, I can't do a self tape. And they said, just get anything on tape. Just get your iPhone. So I had about three lines, very easy to learn them. And uh, in the lunch break, uh, Ken Bentley, our director, held my iPhone while Peter Davison read in the lines of uh, Lord Snowden. And uh, I, I said my lines as the butler, you know, sent it off to my agent. We carried on with the rest of the recording that afternoon. By the time I got back home, I had a message from my agent saying I got the part. So um, <laughs> I, I have the fifth doctor to thank for my part in the crowd, <laughs> which is rather wonderful, isn't it? Fabulous. Absolutely fabulous. <laughs> I yes. mean, it was like I said, it was a tiny part. So you, I mean, I'm in the background. Uh, but it was fascinating to be on a big set because, as you can imagine, it's an epic show. And they'd taken over a big country house somewhere in West London. Um, and they had beautiful vintage cars and, uh, you know, they dressed the set perfectly. And, uh, uh, you know, there, there's a lot of money being thrown around uh, on one of those things. So, you know, I, Friday afternoon, I'm in a, an old studio with uh, Peter and <laughs> reading our lines and having a laugh and, uh, you know, having some donuts. And then on Monday, I'm on this massive Netflix set. So it's, um, yeah, it's a strange job. So you've acted, obviously, on audio with Big Finish, on screen with um, The Crown and, and, and other things. And also you've um, been a stage actor. Uh, I noticed on, again on your bio that you've done The Woman in Black, yeah. which I saw it myself a long, long time ago. And when The Woman in Black comes to the, to the audience, I've never been so scared. <laughs> it's a um, wonderful show. It's a brilliant show. Do you have a preferred medium for acting through? Are you a stage man? Are you a telly man are you a, an audio man or do they all throw, give you something different to get your teeth into well i think you're right actually they're they're, they're they all have their appeal um i mean i've probably done i've done a lot more audio actually because of big finish than anything else because it's quite easy to do it it's quick to record and so the credits sort of mount up and i look at my cv and think wow have i done so many audio plays but uh, I, next year will be my 25th year as an actor since I left drama school. And um, I, I'd say until I started doing lots of audio, I was mostly a stage actor. Um, I've done lots of tours of things, of West End in The Woman in Black and uh, lots of regional theatre for years and years. Um, and there was a point probably five or six years ago where I, I was sort of struck with the realisation that I was more at home in a rehearsal room than I was anywhere else. Um, <laughs> uh, and, you know, it's just completely familiar territory to me. And it's just, uh, it's, it's so exciting to be amongst a, another group of actors and you're rehearsing a scene and working towards something and making lots of discoveries and watching them make discoveries and building towards that first night. I mean, it's a real thrill. Um, so, uh, and of course, uh, it's been terribly frustrating the past few years because COVID uh, you know had a did a real job on the theatre world um, and so it's only really slowly coming back to life now and I haven't been on stage since uh, March 2020 and uh, I was touring with uh, with War Horse it's a wonderful show and we were in Australia with it and um, uh, we'd, we'd uh, just finished in Sydney and all the rumours started flying around about this uh, this illness and uh so you know, our, our tour was cancelled and off we came back home again um but yeah i, I mean i think i get a, a real kick from uh theater work uh, i mean it's so immediate you're talking about the woman in black that show is wonderful because it's just basically a two-hander although as you have suggested there is a third person involved um <laughs> And uh, it's pure theater. It's sort of, you sort of build the story out of nothing in terms of props and set. Um, and, but suddenly you get to the second half of the show and uh, uh, it sort of creeps up on you. The, the, the tension builds and it's, I saw it, even though I, I got the part and I was learning the lines and in rehearsal and I went to see the previous cast. Um, uh, and I've never been more scared than I was in that theater. Uh, absolutely terrified. Wonderful thing. And to be to be in a, a, a live theatre um, and to be as scared as you would be watching a horror film or having a nightmare or something like that. It's, you know, a wonderful thing to do. So. Yeah, you could actually feel when I saw it, you could actually feel the audience collectively holding their breath. Yeah. It was amazing. It's, a, it's just the power of acting. It's incredible. 
Yeah, it is. And it's the power of storytelling, isn't it? And that's the, the great thing uh, that, that, you know, this world gives us, the theatre and uh, the entertainment world, because uh, we all love to be told stories, don't we? It's, you know, I think it's an innate thing in humans. But yeah, so I mean, um, I get a kick out of everything. Uh, audio drama is um, uh, is another thing again because it's much more relaxed. But you have to be very specific. Uh, you have to embody the character completely with your voice. Even though, if you were to watch uh, an audio recording, it's it's hilarious to see how physically people will uh, will act, um, waving their arms around, and uh, you know, I'm gesticulating all over the place when I'm working. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, it's a it's a very different discipline. But I think it's all comes down to the same thing. Even with, with films, it's all it's about knowing what your motivation is and having the character uh, clear in your head and you, knowing what you want to do, doing your prep, not getting in the way of the script, that sort of stuff. So coming back to your big finish work, because you've alluded a lot to that. Um, you said yeah. you've acted with playing chameleon and robots, etc. But the part I think you're going to be most remembered for is Harry Sullivan. Um, how were you approached to, pay, to play Harry Sullivan? Well, um, I'd been working for Big Finish for a few years, probably by that point. Um, and uh, I, I, very early on, I said to David Richardson that I really wanted to work with Tom Baker because he was a childhood hero. Um, and he said, oh, I think we can arrange that. <laughs> and he did. Um, and uh, so I was brought in to play uh, an alien, I think, or possibly a robot, you know, <laughs> in a Tom story. And uh, I played a, a few parts with Tom. So I got to know him and uh, a bit. Um, and David, I think it was David who th who, who thought I, I kind of sounded a bit like Ian Marta. And that I think he said that I was sort of a Harry Sullivan type person. You know, I'm quite an old fashioned type. Um, and he just sent me a text, actually, and I was on my way home from Sainsbury's. Um, and I was, I was about to go on tour with Warhorse. And David said, uh, I'm uh, reluctant to, to tell you this because you're about to go away on tour for two years. But we really want you to play Harry Sullivan. And maybe there's a way we can make it work. And I said, well, we have to make it work. <laughs> I'll do everything I can to make it work. And so for the whole of the, the tour, when I was, uh, you know, in the UK with the show, uh, I would come back and all of my Mondays, which are the Mondays off from the show, uh, I would go down to Tom's, to the studio that Tom uses in Kent um, and, uh, uh, and record the Harry stuff. So, um, yeah, I was determined that it would happen. And I mean, you, you've sort of alluded to your age. I think we're about the same age. Um, do you have any memories of watching Ian Marta as a child? I do. Um, and uh, I mean, I don't know if it was the same with you, but I, I think Doctor Who kind of faded in to my consciousness when I was a boy because uh, it was always on. Uh, and I was born in 1972. So, you know, Pertwee yeah. era, right? Um, uh, and so I probably was in front of the telly for some of John Pertwee's last stories. I don't remember them. don't remember watching them. But I do, I have very sort of vivid images of Tom's very early era. Um, and I know they did repeat a few things as well. So I, I will certainly have caught up with them afterwards. But um, Genesis of the Daleks was, uh, you know, a big one for me. Uh, I mean, incredibly exciting. And Harry, I think, was always kind of there. I mean, I was buying the books as well. And uh, um, so I was certainly very aware of him as a character. Um, and uh, I, then I, later on, I got the, the, LP, or the cassette of Genesis of the Daleks <laughs> when they put the soundtrack out and listened to that. So I had his voice in my head from, you know, very, very young. So, yeah, I think I, I, it's always the way, isn't it, with sort of formative experiences that uh, that is kind of stamped in my mind as the ultimate Doctor Who team. Um, and uh, everybody who watches the programme has their own version of that, don't they? But... Uh, the Doctor and Sarah and Harry is, uh, you know, is the the, the uh, definitive uh, gang for me. And did you study Ian's performance um, to give you inspiration, or have you sort of stripped it back to the character and built your own performance of Harry, or again a mix of both? Well, no, I've. Uh, I mean, I was very glad of an excuse to go back and watch them all again, uh, so I did, um, and I, it felt important because. 
Uh, it's a funny one. The, the, the recastings, uh, they, we want to give a feeling that it, it, it's, it is, you know, just missing stories from those early series. Um, and the way that they're written and the way that the sound design is done, particularly with the Tom stuff uh, and the lost stories that you were, you know, you're aware of um, there, they, they try and make it uh, have that sort of 1975 uh, feel. Um, and so I think it felt very important to me that I should, uh, I should watch those shows again. Um, and as I said, I think I, my voice is quite similar in a way to Ian Martyrs. He's quite, he's got quite a, a mobile voice. It bounces up quite high when he gets, uh, uh, exercised about things. Uh, and then it's quite deep and very RP, very, you know, received pronunciation accent. Um, so, uh, I think I had a lot. Uh, there already in my own voice but yeah I always I always uh, watch a couple of episodes before I record just to try and get his voice in my head and we've now it's a first for both sides of sometimes cool we have actually have a question from a listener uh-huh. um, my friend Paul um, has got in touch and he's asked me to ask you do you wear a duffel coat in the studio when you're recording as Harry to help you get into character <laughs> I'm not that method <laughs> um, but of course, with the, uh, the cost of heating these days, maybe I will have to start doing that. Maybe we all will. Uh, yes. But no, uh, <laughs> it's funny. I'm going to have to. It's an imaginary duffel coat. <laughs> duffel coat of the all, mind. You heard it first here. Imaginary duffel coat. Yes. Fantastic. So you play Harry at different parts of his life. I mean, one that's come out this month, Kaleidoscope, is Harry in the Pertwee era, which he was alluded to on the TV show, but he was never seen. I think in Pertwee's last episode, they mentioned Dr. Sullivan, but he was, yeah. was not seen. So you've got him in the Pertwee and you've got the missing stories with Tom. You've got the unit stories and then you've got the stories with Sylvester. Mm. Um, do you approach playing at Harry in his different part, different times in his life differently? Or is Harry just Harry? Um, well, I think I, I tend to rely on the writers uh, because they're pitching it. Uh, uh, you know, differently depending on the period. And as I said, you know, um, some of the earlier stuff, uh, the writing, you know, it feels like 1975. Uh, but then the, the stuff with Sylvester, that you know, the, the, the couple that have just come out, um, uh, I don't think Harry would ever get jaded, but he certainly becomes more uh, uh, familiar with the way the Doctor works. Um, far less surprised um but uh, i don't i don't feel that i'm changing my voice particularly um but uh you know maybe it's coming across i don't know that he's a bit older um but uh i mean i i remember talking to nick briggs about uh uh some of the early stuff the lost stories that that are coming out are they coming out next year the genesis of uh march i think is it march oh good i think it's march yeah, well, I look forward to hearing them. But um, I've, had them pre- I've had them on pre-order for such a long time, I can't remember. Really? Yeah, yeah, great. I mean, it's extraordinary. We record them. I mean, those ones we probably recorded in 2019 or something like that. And you think, five years from now? I mean, uh, what will I be doing in five years from now? Of course, the world's changed almost entirely since we recorded it. Um, but, uh, yeah, um, those stories, they had a real 70s vibe. And uh, the, the music, you know, it's just sort of classic Who music and um, uh, the way it's written, uh, you know, you get a lot of that for free from, from good writing. And so Harry probably has aged a bit, he maybe become a little bit more uh, world weary, but he's not a cynical chap. Yeah, I mean, I took, I took from the Sullivan and Cross box set, um, Harry has gotten the measure of things a lot more than he did back in the 70s. He's used to you know, a bit, a bit more assertive, a bit more yeah. like he knows that when McCoy's doctor turns up, he knows the doctor's the doctor because he's seen him in the unit files and he knows what sort of character he is. So yeah. he's sort of yeah. he's a lot more together. If that's yes. the right thing. Yeah. Well, it is, and I think it's that's an interesting challenge for the writers because uh, um, you know they're trying to to write a, a very well established character, but um, uh, you know they they. I suppose it's a game really for them, isn't it? They put a character into, into a situation and see how he reacts to it. Um, so when 
Harry's been hanging around with the Doctor for quite some time by this point. So it's all. So, I mean, Sullivan and Cross, going back to that one, listened to it last week, absolutely fantastic stuff. Oh, um, it feels like, the, especially the first couple of episodes of the first story, the Doctor hardly features. And it mm. almost feels like a pilot for a sort of Harry and Naomi series. Is that something you might like to be involved in in the future? Oh, well, that would be great. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I'm really loving playing Harry. Yeah, he's, he's, he's great fun to play. And uh, um, I'm always amazed by the, the, the situations that they will put him in. And, uh, and I think there's a lovely dynamic between him and Naomi. So uh, it would be great if they could do something like that. We'll see, won't we? But uh, it's always the way the actors are always the last to know because they write the stories, they edit the stories, and then they finally tell us that we're going to be recording it. I mean, yeah, Harry and Naomi, they're a, a brilliant double act because they're, I mean, yeah. they're, they're chalk and cheese, but they play off each other fantastically. Yeah, they that's really what mean, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. So you've talked before, you sort of alluded to it a few moments ago about things you recorded with Tom Baker. Now, I've listened to Return of the Cybermen, um, which was a reworking of the original script of Revenge of the Cybermen. You've got another couple coming out with, I think we said March. I think it's March. I apologise if I'm wrong. Um, so a reworking of the original script of Genesis of the Daleks and a reworking of the original script of the Ark in Space. Mm. Is there anything you're allowed to tell us about them? Any little juicy bits you can tell us? Or do we have to wait and not wait and see, wait and hear? Wait and hear. Uh, I'm not sure. I mean, like I said, it's a while since I recorded them. And I haven't looked at the scripts. And we don't get any sort of advanced copies, so I have no idea what they sound like. Um, but, uh, I mean, the Genesis of the Daleks one, I think we're call, are we calling it Genesis of Terror? Is that yeah, right? Daleks call on Genesis of Terror, I think it's called. Oh, there you go, that's the one. Yeah. Um, and uh, it's a fascinating thing. It's, it's, it's kind of a curiosity that because there's only one surviving complete episode of the original draft, first draft. So it's the first episode. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it's that wonderful trip through the, uh, um, the minefield, um, which is so exciting in the first episode. Uh, and so we get to recreate that. And then after that, it's uh, it's we're sort of each of us are narrating uh, synopses of the different following episodes. Um, so that one's uh, it's it's uh, you know a fascinating piece for historians of who to to study. Um, the Ark in space, is, uh, the Ark is much more involved, uh, and it's a wonderful story anyway, isn't it? The Ark in space is anyway. definitely true classic. That one we all love that one, um, and uh, this one develops in different areas. Um, it goes off in quite wild areas and Harry has some, uh, some wonderful adventures. It's a, actually a chance for Harry. I can't tell you any of the details <laughs> about precisely what happens, but uh, he gets to, um, uh, to be, to really play out his sort of uh, uh, action hero uh, um, fantasies, I would say. Because uh, of course we know that Harry was uh, originally supposed to be cast or, or brought in as a character in case they cast an old bloke as the doctor. Uh, and they needed somebody to do the running around. Of course, Tom perfectly happy to run around himself. Uh, so, but on audio, Harry gets to do a lot of a lot of running. <laughs> so, yes, Excellent. I hope you enjoy it. Well, we'll we'll all I'm sure we'll all look forward to listening to them when they come out in March or so next year. And as well as being an actor, you're an artist as well. How do you actually choose the subjects that you draw or paint? Well. Um... I kind of paint the people that I, I'm interested in, I guess, the things that are the, uh, my own passions, really. And so if you look at my, uh, my sort of online stuff, uh, it's James Bond and Doctor Who, really, the <laughs> principal uh, subject matters. Um, and I, I will occasionally veer into the horror world with the uh, Hammer Horrors, because I used to love those as well. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, I'll, I will see an image and I think, oh, wow, that... I find that really exciting or interesting. And, uh, um, you know, I'll just get my pencils out. <laughs> There's a really excellent one I think I saw on your Twitter the other day of Jeremy Brett. Oh, that, yeah. That was superb. It really, really, you, really, it really sort of captured him, if you know what I mean. Right. Well, that's because interesting. He, like, he, yeah, you, I mean, that's, that's what I'm trying to achieve, really, is to try and... Uh, it, it's purely subjective, of course, but trying to, to, uh, to create an image that in some way encapsulates, I think, everything that they mean to me. So if I'm painting Jeremy Brett, then, you know, I, want, I have to find the, the right sort of source images to look at that, that, that look like him as Sherlock Holmes um, and the right back, background. And uh, Yeah, it's sort of, 
oozed a sort of superiority and arrogance, like he was going to just put somebody down straight away. It was, it was yes. excellent. Yeah, really, oh, really you, good man. stuff. Really good stuff. I mean, is there any person um, or subject you enjoy painting more than any other, or you find more relaxing to paint than any other? Well, um, relaxing is an interesting one because uh, because it's sort of a second string job <laughs> for me. There's an element of work involved as well. So uh, um, I think when I was young and I was drawing or painting just for pleasure, it didn't really matter how well it went. You know, if it, if it fell apart and looked bad, then it didn't really matter. I'd crumple it up or I'd t- turn the page. But if I'm, uh, you know, if I if I'm trying to sell prints or something, or if uh, you know I get a few commissions these days, uh, quite a few, so it has to be right. So I have to keep working until I get it right. So uh, uh, yeah, it's not always that relaxing, but um, I do return to the same to a lot of the same subjects. Uh, actually, I just this evening finished a painting of Roger Moore, um, uh, which. Uh, because I, I was always struck with the wonderful photographs of uh, Roger Moore when he was filming A View to a Kill. So he's, you know, he's at the end of his tenure as Bond and he's in his late 50s. But uh, he still looks great, I think. He was still, he's probably too old to play Bond, but I don't care because I love this film. And, um, <laughs> and there's, there are some lovely photographs of him with Cubby Broccoli in Paris, sitting in director's chairs between shots. And he's got a cigar in his hand and he's sort of holding onto Cubby's hand. And it's, uh, <laughs> and I thought, you know, that's, if only we could all be as cool as Roger Moore was in 1985 and he could do whatever he wanted. And, uh, you know, um, uh, so uh, I just finished a little painting of, uh, of Roger sitting in a director's chair with a cigar on the go. Fabulous. Um, yeah, so, you know, that will pop up at some point soon. Um, so I love, I, I mean, I, I and that's a face that's quite hard to capture. I don't know why. So I have to work really hard to get Roger's likeness. Um, Tom, I love painting this. Tom has such a distinctive face. Tom Baker, you know, that, that wonderful nose and the big eyes and the curls and, uh, and you know, the perfect Doctor Who costume. So uh, I've probably been drawing Tom Baker for, you know, as long as he's been Doctor Who. <laughs> Occasionally I will unearth um, ancient drawings that I did in the 70s uh, on the back of cornflakes packets um, with a sort of stub of a pencil of, of, of some strange figure with curly hair and a stripy scarf. And I think, oh, there you go. There's, there's an early drawing, an early Tom. <laughs> Wonderful stuff. Um, really now then, so I'm going to ask you, what does the future hold for Christopher Naylor? What would you like, have you got any ambitions that you haven't fulfill that you would like to? Well, probably hundreds. Uh, I mean, it's a, the thing about being an actor is that uh, every job is finite, pretty much. You know, it's, generally speaking, you know when your end date is going to be, when the, when the theatre contract ends, uh, runs out or when the, uh, um, the filming, your filming dates stop. Uh, and so it always leaves you wanting more. Um, and uh, that's the great luxury of it, but it's also a sort of torture because, uh, you know, you want to keep going. So, uh, I know, like I said before, I haven't been on the stage for a couple of years now, so, and I want to get back on stage. Um, you know, it's, it's a real thrill. And uh, I was talking to a friend of mine from drama school, and she said, I think I'm addicted to adrenaline. Um, and I think that's something that a lot of actors have in common. You know, it's really, really scary thing to do. Um, but I miss it when I'm not doing it and I want to be doing it. And you get a bit of that from uh, filming, certainly, and uh, from audio drama. Uh, I mean, I've got some big finished stuff coming up and hopefully more uh, work on that uh, with them in the new year. So hopefully Harry will carry on for me. But, um, but uh, yeah, I want to get back on stage. <laughs> I'll always keep drawing as well. Well, Christopher Naylor, actor, Painter, Harry Sullivan, thank you very, very much for joining us on the show tonight and giving us so much of your time. My pleasure. Nice to meet you both. Thank Thank you. you.